Spirit of the living God, we come before you, Jesus, thanking you for your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your favor and your mercy. Um, we thank you for your amazing grace. Your amazing, amazing grace. Yes, Lord. Lord. Um, something we struggle with on a continual basis without even realizing it. And so, Father, as we get into your word, we do ask for conviction, challenge, and change. We ask to be um, edified. We ask to be exhorted. We ask to be comforted and built up and just transformed mm -hmm. to rest in you, Jesus. We praise you. We glorify you in your precious name, Jesus. Amen and amen. amen. Okay, so we are in Galatians uh, chapter 4, verse 8 through 20. Um, last week, last week we looked at, uh, the pedagogos, the steward, the guardian, and those different levels of servants in the house and how, um, as unsaved children of the devil, we were born again and then made a full son of God, and that Christ didn't come to simply purchase us for the purpose of being free, but he purchased us for the purpose of making us children of God. And um, we saw that um, because we are now children of God, the Holy Spirit has placed within us the right to cry out to God, my daddy. You guys remember all that? Yep. And so, continue on in verse 8, Paul says to the Galatians, But indeed, when you did not know God, you served those things which by nature are not gods. But after you have known God, or rather are known by God, how is it that you turn again to the weak and beggarly elements to which you desire to be in bondage again? You observe days and months and years. I am afraid for you, yet lest I have labored for you in vain. Okay, so after reminding the Galatians that they have been brought into the deepest and most intimate relationship with God, filled with the Holy Spirit by his grace, through their faith in Jesus, a relationship that's so deep, so loving and so personal that the Father has said, you may call me Abba, my daddy. Paul saying, so what's up with you guys now? You already know that the false gods and idols that you serve really were not gods at all. You know that the idols by nature were nothing more than man-made inanimate objects. And on a spiritual level, you know that the false gods you serve by nature were nothing but demons. So why is it now that you know God, because it was God who knows you and found you first, that you are now turning to put yourself under the basic elements of Jewish religion. Because God freed you from the basic elements of Gentile religion. And this is basically the same thing. It's worthless when it comes to bringing salvation and producing righteousness. Yesterday, I was getting ready to leave and I got uh, cornered by a couple guys in white t-shirts or white button-up shirts. First, I was thinking they were Mormons, but the guy was older and it was with a kid. So that doesn't fit the Mormon 17, 18-year-old elder missionaries. They didn't look like Jehovah Witness because they were kind of, they had on white. They didn't have on gloomy undertaker suits. <laughs> so I was like, okay, let me hear what these guys, where they coming from. And the guy starts talking, you know, and he starts off with, 
You know, in the Bible it says, uh, let us make God in our own image. Okay, so I already know where he's going immediately. He's going into the false religion of the mother God. Because somewhere in there they think God is a woman because he says he made man in his own image and he made them male and female. Anyway, we're kind of going back and forth and I'm like, you know, he's telling me how you got to keep the law to earn your way to, to heaven because that's what makes you right and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, none of that is true. So then he says, well, how come you don't keep the commandments? Because Jesus said, I've never knew you. I said, hi, he was talking about false teachers like you. <laughs> anyway, I don't even know why I went there, but so anyway, They probably banned our house, too. <laughs> Nobody comes and visit us. The Jehovah Witness don't come. The Mormons don't come. They got us on black ball list. <laughs> and the Mother God people probably aren't going to come back anymore. <laughs> so, I need to clarify something, though. The difference between traditional Jewish religion and Judaism. Okay. God's commands in scripture to Israel were the practice of the Mosaic law. But the Jews began to add a bunch of things to the law of Moses that God never said. Um, which is why those traditional Jewish commandments of man cannot be found in in the scriptures okay so there's the law of god from god but then there's a the stuff that man add to it and basically they're turned the law of god into an idol um in matthew 15 6 jesus said thus you have made the commandment of god of no effect by your tradition you hypocrites well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. And so even when God gives us a good thing, we as people can turn that into an idol and a bad thing. On top of that, they added the belief that keeping all of the commandments and the Mosaic law coupled with their self-imposed traditions not only created but established righteousness, which the Lord had no choice but to find acceptable. So speaking on that, Paul says in Romans 9.31, Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the righteousness, uh, attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him shall not be put to shame. Because they were doing righteousness by the working of the law, they stumbled when it came to having faith in Christ. When, when the Lord says, it doesn't matter what you do, you'll never achieve my standard. So take my hand and let me save you. People stumble at that. Why do I need a savior when I can save myself? That's ultimately what it comes to. Because... We need a pat on the back. I need to pat myself on the back. And you need to pat me on the back because of look at what I've done. Um, personally, and Kim always tells me I need to change the things I give examples for, but I only have one life and these are these are my experiences. So <laughs> the way I can a apply exchanging one form of worthless bondage to another form of worthless bondage would be using drugs. 
See, in the beginning, I was addicted to one drug. But then I exchanged that drug for another drug. And it was still destruction headed for the same dead end. But I was free of the first drug. Now my new drug was used by a totally different group of people. They were a different class. <laughs> but at the end of the day, it was still drug addiction and it was still taking me to the same dead end of destruction, only by a different route. So Paul was saying to the Galatians, who were who were mostly Gentiles, he said, like, check this out. The Lord gnoscos you, that is, knows you intimately mm-hmm. on the deepest level, and he has in turn caused you to gnosco him. Mm-hmm. So explain to me why did you turn from your worthless paganism? just to place yourselves in bondage to the weak and beggarly elements of Jewish religion. In other words, why have you chosen to re-enslave yourselves to useless, feeble, powerless, spiritual principles of this world? The bondage to the basic principles of the world is natural before spiritually being born again and known by God. We placed ourselves in bondage to the things of the world, even on a spiritual level when we don't know God. Like the horoscopes. I was in bondage to the horoscopes. I had to get the morning paper, go to the currents, and find out what they told me was going to happen in my life that day. And I had a rabbit's foot. I had a bunch of rabbit's feet until somebody told me it wasn't lucky for the rabbit. <laughs> and I was like, hey, you're kind of right, huh? <laughs> but for many Christians and those who profess themselves to be followers of Christ, they have placed themselves in bondage to legalistic religious rituals and the commandments of men. Some bind themselves to wearing white collars, suits, ties, flowing robes, and satin capes. There's confessional booths. There's kneeling kneeling before statues, burning candles, and praying the saints. Mm -hmm. Others are self-enslaved to dietary regulations. Mm -hmm. They won't eat pork, shrimp, crab, lobster, or any other kind of shellfish. Some aren't allowed to have coffee, tea, or soda because it contains caffeine. And it's like, well, why do people place themselves under legalistic bondage? One of the things about legalism is that it gives a false appearance of spiritual maturity when the reality is simply spiritual immaturity, is self-righteousness, and is pride by turning self back to glorifying self, patting myself on the back for the things that I've done and the things that I do. Our human nature loves to be patted on the back. We love to hear good job for hard work and accomplishments. Well, nowadays, we love to hear good job for not doing any kind of work. And you've accomplished (laughs) this by not doing anything. But in the old days, it was work hard to achieve something. Have a good work ethic and you'll be successful. Now it's do nothing and you should be successful and everybody should pat you on the back. Mm -hmm. 
Proverbs 20, verse 6, the Holy Spirit said, Most men will proclaim each his own goodness, but who can find a faithful man? In Luke 18, 8, Jesus said, Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on earth? In legalistic traditions, methods, and systems, people glorify themselves, and they proclaim each his own good deed. Mm. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking sometimes when you're talking to Christians who are really just stagnated in their walk but they want to give you a list of things that they're doing. And it's like, okay, but where's your commitment? Well, I do this and I do that. Okay, but where's your commitment? But I do this, that, and the other. And the Lord, I've, I, I see what the Lord has done in my life. Okay, but where's your commitment? Where's your commitment to the body of Christ? Well, I don't do what I used to do, okay, but that's not how this works. <laughs> David Guza says, as Christians, when we place ourselves under the bondage of workspace, cause and effect relationship with God. Oh, wait, let me reread that. As Christians, we can place ourselves under the bondage of a workspace, cause and effect relationship with God. But this is moving backward, not forward. By writing turn again, Paul shows the Galatians were not turning to a new error, but coming back to an old one. Mm -hmm. The idea of a works relationship with God. Legalism caters to and recognizes our flesh by putting a focus on what we achieve for God and not on what Jesus did for us. Mm -hmm. That's good. So verse 10, Paul says, you observe days, months, seasons, and years. Observing Jewish days meant things like Sabbath days and annual feast dates that were also considered Sabbath days. Um, in Matthew eleven twenty-eight, 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Our Sabbath is in Jesus. There's also the Sabbath year every seven years um, when no planting and harvest was done for a whole year, which gave the farmers a rest and the land. And Hebrews 4.10 says, for he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works as God did from his. You know, I, I know people that talk about they keep the Sabbath day and they 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 go to church on Saturday. Well, that's fine. I mean, that's fine, but it's not righteous. And then my statement is, well, when's the last time you had a Sabbath year? Like, you didn't go to work because you're keeping the Sabbath, right? You got to keep the Sabbath. You got to have a Sabbath year every seven years. The religious years celebrated um, were the year of Jubilee. And that was like every 50 years when all debts were zeroed out and property went back to the uh, family of the original owners. <laughs> and the celebrated months were like things like the new moon because, you know, we, we operate on a solar <laughs> basis but the Jews operated on a lunar basis. So things were based on the moon rather than the sun, right? So like their day begins at sunset where our day begins at sunrise, right? You read the Bible it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the evening and the morning were the first day, not the morning and the evening. 
So that's why Friday is the beginning of the Sabbath, Friday evening, because the sun is going down, the moon is coming up. Mm. Hope all that makes sense to you yeah. guys. I'm not seeing. I don't know. I did not know that. I'm kind of going to go to church on that. Um, and the, the seasons, that refer to the feasts that lasted for a few days or a few weeks. You know, like the... The Feast of Tabernacles, it was called the Feast of Weeks, or the Passover, which lasted, you know, a week. And so in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it states, Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are unleavened. unleavened. Indeed, Christ is our Passover, who was sacrificed for us. So all these things were fulfilled in Christ turning back to them as a means of righteousness apart from Christ is placing oneself under bondage. The Lord had given Israel laws, feasts, and specific days of rest to set Israel apart from the rest of the world. However, those laws, feasts, special days, years, all pointed to Jesus and they were fulfilled in him. So the Judaizers or the legalists were trying to rebuild those walls of separation that separated the Jews from the Gentiles that Christ had tore down. See, Israel was given these specific laws that set them apart from the rest of the world. It made them a peculiar people. But in Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile. So to turn back to those separations means, uh, it, it, as a means of righteousness and salvation, is to deny all that Jesus did and all that he has done or is doing. Ephesians 2.14 states, For Jesus himself is our peace, who has made both one, and he has broken down the middle wall of separation, that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. In other words, you had your, your Jews on this side with their laws, ordinances, commandments, and traditions. You had the Gentiles who were just doing whatever they were doing. And Jesus came to break down that wall of separation so that one man from the two could be in Christ. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, it makes, it makes sense. And so the whole point of Christ's coming is Gentiles don't have to become Jews to become saved. And you can't keep the law to be saved. You just need that step of faith in Christ alone. So uh, verse 11, Paul says, I'm afraid for you, lest I have labored for you in vain. Basically, he's like, you Galatians, the way you're tripping, you got me scared that all the work that I put in for you to know Jesus could be for nothing. And he wasn't saying, I'm afraid that you guys have lost your salvation or could lose your salvation. The, the Galatians and the Judaizers, both Jews and Gentiles, were saved, and nothing could ever take that away or make them unborn after they had been born again by the Holy Spirit. What Paul was saying was, even though you're saved, and I put all the labor in and teaching you to be fruit-producing saints through a continual walk of faith in Christ, I'm afraid that you have become or will become unfruitful. Remember in Matthew 13, Jesus told a parable about the sower sowing seed. He said, behold, a, 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 a sower went out to sow and some seeds fell on the thorns and the thorns sprang up and choked them. Now, he who received the seed among the thorns is he who hears the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of richness, riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful the cares of the world 
things that people care about can choke out the word in a believer's life and it become unfruitful. The Galatians were turning to the basic elemental elemental principles of works for righteousness. That would be the cares of the flesh or works-based righteousness and it chokes out the fruit of faith. If somebody came to you and told you, and people have this idea. I mean, you probably heard somebody say it. Yeah, I'll come to church when I get when I get right, when I get things together. I and mean, it's like, that's not how it works. That's a work-based righteousness. It makes you unfruitful. If I came to you with a list and said, well, you can't be saved until you do X, Y, and Z, you won't get saved. It's worthless. It chokes out the fruit of faith. And so Paul is like, I'm afraid that I've labored in vain and now you're not producing fruit. You're just fruitless because you're teaching others the way to get saved is by works. He says, brethren, I urge you to become like me, for I became like you. You have not injured me at all. Okay, so we've been going through Paul's letter. He starts off with not calling them saints. Then he says, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? But now his tone begins to change and the shift from a teacher or an authority figure to revealing his heart of love for the Galatians as their older brother, um, the one who loves and protects his little siblings. So he says, look, remember when I came to you guys and you didn't know the Lord. You weren't practicing any Jewish laws. You weren't celebrating any of their feasts. And I didn't come to you practicing or celebrating those things either. Instead, I lived among you as you were in order for me to bring you to Christ. Mm -hmm. Then when you accepted Christ and got saved, I didn't change and turn and start pointing you to laws and traditions of Judaism. Mm -hmm. I showed you how to walk freely in Christ like me. Mm -hmm. Now, he was not saying I became like you by getting involved with you in your sin. He said, but rather I took part in those neutral things in life. I went to your sporting events and opera and ballet shows. You know, th those are the things that I would hate to have to do. But if I'm trying to <laughs> get somebody to Jesus, I may have to do these things. He's like I ate non-kosher meals with you when you invited me to dinner. Okay, so I learned something about being polite at dinner. We were invited to another pastor's house, and his wife made this lasagna, and it was just spectacular. I cannot eat cheese. Well, I don't like cheese that much, but I'm really not supposed to eat cheese. So we're sitting there eating, and I felt my stomach knotting up as we were eating. And it was like, this is going to hurt. So from now on, I'm not eating your lasagna. People always tell me, try my... Try my, try my dressing. I don't like dressing. You never had mine. I don't care whose it is. I don't like it. That was the one thing I got a whooping for when I was little. Then they just said, forget it. He ain't going to eat it. It'd be 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm still sitting at the table. I'm not eating it. That is a lima bean. 
So if you th tell me your dressing is good, that's fine. I'm not eating it. I don't want no macaroni and cheese. I don't want no cold salad. <laughs> don't want a cold sandwich. The meat was warm when they killed it. I don't want it cold on my food. So Paul is saying, look, I became like you guys so that I can help you to become like me and walk freely in Christ. In 1 Corinthians 9, Paul said, 919, Paul said, for though I am free from all men, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win the more. And to the Jews, I became as a Jew that I might win the Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. And to those who are without the law, I became as without the law. Not being without a law towards God, but under the law towards Christ. Now what that means is, the Gentiles didn't have the law, but the natural law of God still stands over all men. So I didn't get involved with sinful things. But I didn't live amongst them as a Jew. And I exercised the law of Christ, which is the law of love. And why? So that I might win those who are without the law. To the weak, I became as weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now I do this for the gospel's sake, that I may be a partaker of it with you. In other words, I came and laid my life down so that you could see Jesus. Now think about it like this. God, the glorious God in heaven, left his throne to become one of us so that he could take us home with, uh, with him. So I don't know if you don't like roaches or you don't like rats or you, but think about becoming a roach to save the roach. <laughs> Does it make sense? Yes. And live amongst the roaches. That was, I mean, you can't even, you, we can't even imagine what God had to do, how he humbled himself to be amongst us so that we could be with him. And so this is how we, that's our example, and that's how we are to be to reach others, right? In our walk to reach the lost and minister, uh, minister to others, we have to be welcoming, not condemning. Jesus, by his enemies, was called a, sin, a friend of sinners, not because he was involved with their sins, but because he ministered to them just as they were, instead of placing holy standards upon them to be in his presence. They said, come on over for dinner. It's going to be hookers and gamblers. And he's like, cool, let's go. <laughs> and then the religious people are standing outside like, look at him eating with sinners. Mm -hmm. But he ain't eating with y'all. <laughs> Jesus loved on them with no judgment to meet them right where they were so that he could bring them to where they needed to be. Oh, That's what compassion is. Compassion is I see you where you are. I'm going to meet you right where you are, not to keep you there, but to help you get to where you need to be. Sometimes I'm talking to people and they'll cuss and say, excuse me. And I'll say, don't trip, like be yourself. We can't be the type of Christians uh, uh, that when somebody cusses, we, we run off screaming, oh, my holy virgin ears. <laughs> I 
Now, I will say this. <laughs> when we started allowing the kids to, you know, listen to their music, whatever, and it was like, you got to put on some headphones. Yeah. Because <laughs> that nice. garbage is driving me crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and bleep, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Put on headphones. Yep. So what are you So Paul says, listen, you haven't injured me at all. In other words, he's saying, please don't think that I'm taking this personal. I'm not angry with you guys and you haven't hurt my feelings. In fact, don't you remember the sweet fellowship that we had when we first met? Mm -hmm. You didn't mistreat me when I first preached to you. I remember you treated me good and that's dear to my heart. So please don't be offended or angry with me. I have not turned my back on you, so don't turn your backs on me. In verse 12, he says, Brethren, I urge you to become like me. Oh, we already read that, huh? <laughs> verse 13, you know that because of my physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at first. And at my trial, which was in my flesh, you did not despise or reject, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. What then was the blessing you enjoyed? For I bear you witness that if possible, you would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Okay, so the book of Acts doesn't give us any details concerning this, but Paul says the only reason why I first went to Galatia in the first place is because I was sick. Now, this is pretty powerful because first, Paul could not heal himself, mm -hmm. although he was used to heal many others. And that's because I'm saying that because of the false doctrine that says that if you're sick or if you're broke or if you're tired, it's because you're in sin and you don't have enough faith. Well, Jesus must have not had any faith because he was broke. He didn't have a place to live. He didn't have a donkey, a horse, a, a chariot. He walked everywhere he went. Secondly, Paul was in the ministry and he was on fire. But he had come down with, with some sort of ailment um, that made him sick. And it sounds like he had planned or, or wanted to go to an entirely different region other than Galatia, but God used his ailment to force him and send him to the region of Galatia. He used this sickness to get him to Galatia. So he says, you know that because of a physical infirmity, I preached the gospel to you at the first because I was sick, I ended up there with you guys. He said, but you didn't despise me and you weren't repulsed by my infirmity. Infirmity. In fact, you lovingly embraced me and treated me so good. You treated me like you would if I was an angel or Jesus himself. You welcomed me in and you loved on me. Now, because of the text, Paul must have had something that made his appearance repulsive and his eyes were probably runny and pussy. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. But that's why he says, your love for me was so deep that if it were possible, you would have dug out your own eyes and given them to me. But he also could have just been using that as a figure of speech. We don't know. But in either case, the Galatians weren't put off by his appearance and they loved on him. They loved the gospel message and they would have done whatever they could to help minister to his physical needs as he was ministering to their spiritual need. In verse 16, I was thinking about putting this on the front of the pulpit. Have I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth?
Don't get any bad either. <laughs> When people personalize everything, they feel <laughs> anything said to them is done so with a malicious intent yeah. to either hurt them or destroy them. And it's very hard dealing with immature people who think they're mature, who cannot take correction because they take education as humiliation. It's always the most immature people who think they are super mature. Mm -hmm. Especially when people first get saved. I mean, it's like, wow, I've learned all this new stuff. Okay, but your knowledge is far exceeding your experience. And you haven't even lived it yet. Now, some people are malicious in their intent. But just as much so, many of us are not malicious and speak the truth in love so that others can grow. Amen. Think about it like this. Now, think about this. You'll hear people say, God is good. God is love. God is kind. But when scripture confronts their sin, they say it's hate speech and the Bible needs to be rewritten <laughs> or banned. People would much rather you feed them with lies that make them feel good rather than give them the truth that will heal them. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And Proverbs 26, 28 says, A lying, flattering tongue, tongue works ruin, hating those who are crushed by it. In other words, people are like this. I don't care if your motive is to take advantage of me or destroy me. I don't believe that's the truth because that's the way I feel. So tell me lies. Tell me sweet little lies. People love to flock to teachers in teaching that tells them what they want to hear rather than what they need to hear. In Isaiah 30, verse, verses 1 through 11, the Lord says, Woe to the rebellious children, says the Lord, who take counsel, but not of me, and who devise plans, but not of my spirit, that they may add sin to sin, now go write it down on a tablet before them and note it on a scroll that it may be for a time to come and forever that this is a rebellious people, lying children, children who will not hear the law of the Lord, who say to the seers, do not see, and to the prophets, do not prophesy to us right things, but speak, speak to us smooth things, prophesy deceits, and get out of the way, turn aside from the path, and cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from being before us. Ooh, that's what's happening right now. Wow. Wow. Do not tell us the truth. Tell us lies that make us feel good. Mm. Promise me you'll give me the world if I bow down and worship you. I mean, it's amazing when you talk to people and they talk about the stuff that they hate, but that's the very thing you're embracing. You're embracing the very thing you claim you're fighting against. You know, I was talking to this girl, matter of fact, it's an interview that she wanted to interview me on, and she was talking about all the systemic racism and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, okay, that's cool. But, you know, Margaret Sanger created Planned Parenthood to exterminate the Negro. Well, I believe in a woman's right to choose. You're not making no sense. You said you hate racism. It's a stated fact. Exterminate the Negro. No, that's different. Okay. People 
people are hypocritical because people have agendas. And when you have an agenda, you don't have integrity and there's no truth. Truth has no agenda. And people say, well, you, you talk about the Bible, that's an agenda. No, that's God's agenda. That's not my agenda. When people have an agenda, there is no truth. Anyway, verse 17. Paul says, they zealously court you, but for no good. Yes, they want to exclude you, that you may be zealous for them. But is but it is good to be zealous in a, in a good thing always, and not only when I'm present with you. Okay, so now Paul is switching from the loving big brother to the loving protective pastor. He says, look, these brothers who are coming to you uh, with this false legalistic teaching, they're trying to win you over by wooing you. They're being sweet now with cards and flowers and serenading you beneath the window. But that's just the bait to lure you away from the freedom found in the grace of God. And then once they have you hooked and isolated from me and anyone who will point you to the solid teaching of the scriptures, they'll hook you into following and serving them alone. Proverbs 16, 19 says, two of the things that God hates are a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. False teachers and false teaching always seeks to drive a wedge in between God and the person following God in order to turn them to themselves. In Acts 20, um, verse, verses 27 through 30, Paul said to the Ephesian pastors and elders, Remember how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock which is among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Then he says this. For I know this, after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. One of the big things about false teachers and false teaching is that they don't try going after lost sinners to win them to Christ. Instead, they go after Christians who are basically weak in their faith and looking for some extra power and some extra revelation that only special believers possess. So they go after people who are already believers to turn them to following them. Paul says, it's a good thing to be zealously to zealously woo someone for something good to a good purpose and point them to Christ that they can grow in the grace of God. So always continue to be zealous for the right thing with the right motives and not just when I'm with you, but also when I'm away. In ministry, I learned by serving in the ministry and watching how this ministry worked that God will use you, but man will use you up. There are people in ministry, in leadership, whose ministry is my ministry, not the Lord's ministry. And so the way they, they build this ministry is it, makes people dependent upon them to build their ministry instead of pointing people to depend on Christ and go wherever he wants them. Mm -hmm. 
And the sheep are the Lord's. Verse 19. My little children, for whom I labor in birth again until Christ be formed in you. I would like to be present with you now and change my tone, for I have doubts about you. Okay, so now Paul switches from a pastor to a loving parent. And he says, my little children. And the word used for little children is technon. It means infants and toddlers. So he says, I love you so much. I'm like a mother loving you so much that I'm going through labor pains twice to bring you into the world. Okay, I've never had a baby. But the pain I see you guys go through till you get the epidural. <laughs> I didn't get the epidural. <laughs> it's like, oh, you go, you go through all that pain, the baby comes out, right? But then what if you had to do it again for the same kid? Does it make sense? Yeah. Labor pains twice for the same kid. That's why you have babies like years apart because it's like... <laughs> Oh, yeah, I want another baby. Oh, I forgot about this part. <laughs> but if you had the baby, had the labor pains, and then somehow or other you had to go through it again to... You gotta go through that with you have twins. Yeah. That's still one pain for one kid. Mm-hmm. It's not the same kid twice. Okay. Well, you just like the same so he's like... <laughs> I love you so much. I'm like a loving mother that I'm going through labor pains twice to bring you into the world. It's like he's saying, you're causing my heart so much pain. It's like going through giving birth to the same baby twice. And I just don't know what to do with you. However, I'm going to keep laboring for you. Till Christ be formed in you. Wow. Now laboring with someone till Christ form is formed in them is walking with them through the roller coaster trials of life and helping them along. Sometimes it's being their wheelchair, other times it's being their crutch. Yeah. But it's helping, not catering or coddling. And there's a big difference. I was in a wheelchair for months. But the wheelchair wasn't to be my life. I was in the wheelchair till my legs got stronger. Then I got a cane. Because I don't know why, because the weak side and the weak hand were on the same side, so I couldn't hold the canes, which didn't make any sense. My auntie came and brought me a can opener that you twist. <laughs> she said, here, baby, work your hands. And I'm like, my arm don't even move. Why are you guys laughing at me? You guys are some cruel people. <laughs> But sometimes we're to be somebody's crutch. Sometimes we will be their wheelchair. But only if they're willing to grow. That's good. See, some people are like, leave me alone. I'll do it on my own. Help me stand up and walk. But other people are like, no, carry me. We're there to simply supply the strength they need as they're willing to go and grow. It's a loving hand up, not a crippling hand out that makes them dependent upon anything other than the grace of God. So Paul says, I'm laboring in birth again for you, with you, until Christ is formed in you. 
Now think about it. They were heathens. One day they were worshiping him. The next day they stoned him. And he kept on laboring with them until they gave up the idols, until they gave up all the crazy stuff and got saved. And he's like, okay, now you guys are doing good, so go ahead. Uh, I got to keep on going. He, here's, oh, now they're being Judaizers. So he's like, okay, so now I'm back laboring again to unlock you. Right? I see people go through this all the time, especially parents. And they have teenagers. And for some reason, they're trying to live this teenager's life into the right way and going crazy because that person has their own mind and there's a certain point at a certain age that everybody gets to where nobody can't tell me nothing and so let them bump their head or bump your head trying to stop them from bumping their head but if they bump their head enough times like you bumped your head enough times, and you'd be like, you know what? I think I'll do something different. <laughs> but as long as you keep being the pillow, they'll never learn. So Paul says, I'm laboring with you to you get up on your own legs, on your own strength, in the grace of God, and walk. In verse 20, he says, I would like to be present with you now and to change my tone for I have doubts about you. Okay, Paul says, I wish I was there so that you could hear my tone because type does not communicate my attitude. Mm -hmm. In other words, <laughs> stay out <on> my notes. <laughs> Don't have important conversations through text and email. <laughs> Call the person. Or go sit with the person in person. Do a video chat. Because <laughs> when people read texts from others, they cop an attitude that they think the other person has the attitude. <laughs> and then they're reading the text out loud, wobbling their head, shaking their finger. And, get this. <laughs> and that's not even what the text is saying. None of that is going on. That's why I always put pictures and hearts and smiley faces on it. And don't read into those. It's just happy. <laughs> so if you get a happy heart face or something, <laughs> don't, don't, don't. I put the little blowing kisses and all that stuff because I'm saying, hey, this is. Good. Yeah, don't, don't, don't add nothing to it. I'm telling you now. <laughs> It's just my way of saying, don't trip. So Paul says, I have doubts about you. Now, as a pastor, as a shepherd, as a leader, as a parent, as a Christian, we all have a sphere of influence of people that we are discipling, whether we want to be or not. Proverbs 27, 23 tells us, be diligent to know the state of your flocks and attend to your herds. Paul said, listen, I'm concerned for you all and I can't be there at this time and you're stressing me out. Often when we read the scriptures, uh, when we read it, we, we read the Lord looking down and scowling upon us when he's addressing our sin. But he's looking down with tears in his eyes and an aching heart saying, come on, my little child, my tech nine. Get up and let's keep going. The Lord loves, loves, loves you. He's not angry. 
he demonstrated his love for us by dying on the cross when we were still his enemies and sinners. How much more so now that you belong to him? And I think God is probably the real, the only parent when he disciplines and says, this is going to hurt me more than it hurt you. He's probably the only one that that's really true. I never had a parent tell me this is going to hurt me more than this going to hurt you. Because I had a comeback because I was waiting for him to tell me that. It's going to be, well, then give me the belt. And if it's going to hurt you more than hurt me, give me the belt. The switch rolls here. But for the Lord, he's like, this hurts me more than it hurts you. I stretched my arm out, arms out and died because I love you. And ladies, I think that's kind of special because you're like, oh, I want a man who would die for me. Well, Jesus did. So just remember, we are the Lord's little babies. Amen. Amen. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you that your heart for us and your view of us is your little children. Toddlers with saggy diapers. And we can't do it without you. So you gave us your spirit where we can cry out, my daddy. And that you keep us and protect us from those who would desire to lead us astray. Including our own selves. And we praise you for that. And we thank you. And if you are an unbeliever. And you want to know Jesus and you want to have that spirit where you can call, call God my daddy just say this prayer Lord Jesus forgive me I am a sinner I believe that you are God in the flesh I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day I believe you have received me as your child, and I thank you. If you said that prayer and you believe it in your heart, you are now a child of God. And there's a party in heaven for you. So, Lord, uh, as we go on throughout our week, Lord, um, give us opportunities to be examples of your light. We ask that your peace pour forth through us to impact others. And Lord, um, as believers, help us when we don't understand your ways, because your ways are higher than our ways. But help us just to really trust that you are God on the throne all by yourself. In Jesus' name, amen. Good, good.